Let me welcome the guests in the studio with me, Oliver Bakavomawo, a lawyer. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon to you. Thank you for having me. How's Ghana for, I mean, treating you? Uh, Ghana's always been good to me, so I'm happy to be here. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> anyway, so well, the other guest with me in the studio as well is Gabriela Tete, who is also the uh, communications officer for the Central Region, representing the NDC, also with me. Thank you for coming. Good afternoon. Uh, you, thank God you've changed your hairstyle. <laughs> so we have uh, Richard Anhyagba, who is also is the, um, oh, I think your mic is off, who is the Director of Communications for the MPP to join us in the discussion as and when we get there. But for now, I start straight. Let me get to, you, to the uh, Supreme Court ruling that's come up. Oliver, uh, thank you again for your time. Are you surprised of the rulings? First one had to do, okay, yours. The one you took to court yeah. has to do with the COVID-19 yes. restrictions. Yes. So the story says the Supreme Court has, in a unanimous decision, declared the as unconstitutional the law that allowed government to impose restrictions during the COVID-19 pandemic, right? <laughs> Parliament in 2020 passed in the Imposition Law of Restrictions Act to allow restrictions provided for the Article 21 of Ghana's 1992 Constitution to be imposed. Uh, and the said constitutional provision allow restrictions to be put in place in the interest of the defense, public safety, public health, or uh, the running of essential services on the movement of residents within Ghana uh, of any person or persons generally or any class of persons. That's the law I was trying to quote. So it says that this law allow government to issue various instruments while health authorities manage the COVID-19 pandemic let me cut it here because you're here how did it the ruling get to you were you expecting this outcome um i, I think that now in our republic um nobody goes to the supreme court expecting anything uh, to be honest mm. but we have always been clear from the beginning that even if it's just for posterity to recall that there was an at least an attempt to challenge this law that that is on record so we are surprised that unanimously they agreed with us which we think is important and enhances the rule of law generally but let us remind ourselves what this is about. From the very beginning, we have been clear that Parliament put together a law that allows the President to essentially rule by decree. So anytime the President came on TV and said, follow Ghanaians, he was essentially making law. This is unprecedented in our history. The powers under which the Constitution contemplates we could ever have this is in wartime, when we have, we have declared a state of emergency where there's an ability for us to suspend fundamental freedoms and, and human rights. Yeah. And that there's a regulated process. Parliament must be involved. It must be reviewed constantly. But what we did with the imposition of restrictions is that we sidestepped all of that and we gave the president essentially war powers in, in respect of the pandemic. And our fear has always been the potential of abuse. The, the nature and extent of our democracy is the expectation that presidential powers must always be limited. In particular, as it concerns this act, it does the opposite. It puts Parliament in a subservient position where the President assumes parliamentary powers mm. and decides to act as he pleases. This has been the greatest source of fear for us as to what the dangers of our, we're lacking for, for what our Republic would mean. So we are happy that you know, eventually the Supreme Court agreed with us that the law was unconstitutional in terms of this power it gives the President to, uh, to suspend our human rights. Unfortunately, much of it has been used within the, the COVID period. Yeah. And persons have been, I think one individual was at least jailed under that law. And so many of our lives were disrupted because of it. But for us, the important victory is the posterity and what tomorrow looks like. The fear that somebody cannot come up under those powers, under anything. Because the nature of the law is that it was not only tied to the COVID-19 pandemic. It's like whenever the president so decides. <clears throat> and so we're happy that this, was, this, this law has eventually been overturned. So, I, I, from what you're saying, it obviously goes beyond just uh, setting a precedence for next government's authorities to follow through. Yeah. But it has definitely, uh, you know, caused certain damages in the past, yes. for want of a better expression. Absolutely. If you remember, one of the conversations when the, final, the, the, minister, the Minister of Health went before Parliament... And in terms of all the abuses with respect to COVID financing, it was that we were in a state of emergency. And so right. we could do essentially what we wanted. Yeah. And what we are saying is that law is not suspended in a period of emergencies. That law requires, it is, it is particularly in emergencies that law must act. If not, then we are in a situation whereby abuse is at its highest potential. Mm. 
Mm. So this for us is to restore the faith in law. Mm. That even in emergencies, what you do is that law that applies in emergencies must properly apply. You don't go about and do anything and just get away with it. This is what we are trying. This is the kind of uh, so, vision we are having so for our even republic. in a state of financing, where they go with always in a state of emergency. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Someone can in actually fact, take that up. Yes. Then. In fact, one of the things which I was afraid was going to happen was that if you're following the conversations around the DDEP, yeah. or the negotiation of the bonds and whatever, our biggest fear was that this law allowed them to naturally take people, take over people's bonds. Because essentially what it says is that it gives you the power to deal with emergencies in any form whatsoever. And what has been the argument? The argument is that we are in this economic mess because of COVID-19. So they could essentially tie it to COVID-19, to the Rukin russia war, and say that government is entitled to seize people's bonds because of the law. That is the far-reaching nature of this law. It suspends every single right, whether it's the right to life, or the right to housing, the right to property. That is what we are we're fearing. And, you know, even under law, in international law, there's a recognition that you can derogate from certain fundamental rights in times of war. Particularly because in times of war, it is really difficult for certain normal processes of the law to function. This elevates it even beyond that and creates a system where the president could not be checked. You know, when we took this on, so many people told us, well, this is not a sexy thing. You know, nobody is talking about it. And he it says it's particularly when the issues are not sexy. They are not ones in which it rouses media attention that we as civil society need to be particularly vigilant as to how law operates and how it affects our lives. This is why this victory is important. Uh, too many things, <laughs> too many things running through my head. I'm, I'm now I'm really at a loss as to even which question should, should you know. Follow. No, I understand. I, I mean, it's it's one of the laws which have been under discussed. I mean, when the when the ruling came, yeah. I appreciated what has been ruled on. But with your further explanation, it makes me and appreciate it better. Yeah. That then there are many, even by just the ruling of this yeah. uh, uh, case, yeah. there are many. Of these unconstitutional Absolutely. happenings within our body politicking. In fact, let me give you an, an, an example. Um, do you remember when, you know, in the beginning of the country wanted to go on a demonstration, there was a whole conversation about the executive not allowing us to do the demonstration. Right, right, right. One of the justifications was, again, this law. Right. And we were saying that it was a test for whether or not the constitution was still alive within the during the pandemic years. It's essentially a law that allowed the president to do, to change, I mean, a man into a woman oh if he so desired. But that is, that is the fear, and that's one of the things we have been worried about, that all politics aside, there are certain things which, by, by effect of transitioning into the 1992 era and a democracy, mm. that we have agreed not to do. To have an all-powerful president that could rule as if it was a military dictator. This law gave the president that powers. In fact, when we went to court, we didn't, nobody had access yeah. to the instruments under which the positions were being were being uh, imposed. They weren't even at assembly press. They had to be printed off uh, from the AG's department in the morning and gave to the court. Even the court did not have the law, but it was still law because of this act. These were the dangers we we're, were facing with. So we wow. are very extremely happy, and particularly I must acknowledge our lawyers, Justice Saik, Cletus Alenga, mm -hmm. who had been first through this uh, whole process, but also How the various eight? individuals. Yes, we brought eight oh, people together. Okay. The various individuals who joined Professor Tuya from the University of Ghana School of Law, Dr. Sena Day Tutu from the University, uh, University of Ghana School of Law, uh, Samsi Anyanini, Golda Ado, uh, Face the Country Convenience, Felicity Nelson, and Benjamin Daku, and then the, our institutional uh, arm, which is Democracy Hub and Democratic Accountability Lab. All these individuals that we put together was to ensure a certain cross-section of Ghanaians who were coming out against something which we felt was injurious to the health of our democracy. So the ruling has come. Yeah. Will it take retrospection on what has happened in the past? Well, the nature of when the, the Supreme Court declares a law as unconstitutional is mm -hmm. that everything that was done prior to is, is, is unlawful because it is void from when it was first passed. Right. So there's no constitutional or legalness to anything that has happened prior to the decision, yeah. it takes effect from when the law was passed, that no, that was wrong to begin with. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, somebody was asking me, so what, does, what happens now, considering that we were made to stay at home mm -hmm. uh, during that period? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I don't think that all the wrongs that have happened in the past can be redressed. Yeah. But our argument has never been that the government or the state was not entitled to take certain measures to manage a public pandemic. We said that that authority already existed under the Public Health Act. But the fact of passing a new legislation 
that gave the president this amount of powers was obscene and that we risked the danger of somebody coming along and abusing these powers. This same thing existed. And for us, you know, for, for those who are interested in constitutional history a bit, the reason why we intentionally chose eight people was because we were going back to a time when the, public, the Preventive Detention Act was challenged during Nkrumah's years. And the Supreme Court essentially refused to recognize the danger of that law and sided with the government then. It was Akoto and seven others. And so we decided to mimic that, Professor Tuya and seven others, to show the historical nature of what, we are, what was in front of us. That if the court missed the ball on this, 50 years down the line, in the same way that we talk about the Ria Akoto decision as a black spot in our nation's history, this would have been a black spot in the nation's history as well. Thank <laughs> you.